Hallelujah. 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 If you would just stand to your feet and open up your Bibles with me, we're going to get into the Word. Kids, you guys are dismissed. I just want to say welcome to everyone who's joining us today. It's good to see all of you in the house of the Lord today. Can we make all of our guests feel welcome for joining us today? Amen. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. As we're going to go right into the Word. And it is our custom to stand as we honor the Word of God. If you would join us in standing as we reverence and honor His Word. In which God is about to speak into our lives. Amen. And amen. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. So that if it doesn't sound exactly like what you have... We should have it up on the screen, yes. You can follow along if you would read with me. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart. Somebody say new cart. And brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, I, I am so serious. There has to be some Hawaiian dudes that are Israelites. Or somehow, you know, so, some, some, someone from the lineage of, of Israel um, became part of the Hawaiians. Because some of these names are just like, he was Hawaiian. Ahio, Abinadab's son, were guiding the cart as it left the house carrying the ark of God. And Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and all of the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, tires and, and, and lyres and, and, and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they had arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah. God struck him dead because of this, and so Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. Of course, David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah, and he named the place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it still is called today. So David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, How could I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided to move the ark into the city, not to move the ark into the city of David, instead he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, the, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything that he has because of the ark of God. And so David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great celebration. Interesting that the Lord will put it in Pastor Cassie's heart to really lead us into some worship this morning. Because we see here that as bringing in the presence of God, that after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and fattened calf, and David danced before the Lord with all of his might, wearing his priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing of ram's horns. And, but as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. And when she saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in place inside the special tent David had prepared for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. Title of the message is this. Bringing back the glory. Bringing back the glory. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, first of all, for who you are. It is because of who you are, Father, that we have whatever we have in our lives. You are our everything, Father. Our victories are because of you and everything, Father, all of our triumphs, our success, all is found in you, Father. Father God, Lord, we thank you for what you're about to speak into our lives, Lord. I believe that this is your word for right now, this day, Father. Yes, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bring revelation to your word. Help us reveal it so that we might understand it, Father, so that we might apply it to our lives. Let it not just be a message in which we hear, but not become doers of, Father. 
I pray, Father God, Lord, that we would put our faith into action, that we would live out our faith each and every day and bring glory unto your name, Father. Speak into every part of our lives and every person, Father, in a very personal way. And Lord, it's to you that we give all glory for this in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It's funny, as I was praying that, I was just thinking of how many times when I was in a service before, and the pastor would be preaching, and it felt like he was just looking right at me. You ever feel like that before? Can I just break something to you? I'm not looking at you. Your wife or your, 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 your husband did not call me last night and tell me all the stuff up on you. That's just how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit will take a message and, and, and make it very personal to every, every hearer that would listen and open up their hearts to hear it. So let the Holy Spirit speak to you and take it as though the Lord is speaking to you. Can you say amen? amen. David is bringing back the glory of God. It had been, it had been uh, taken or, or when Israel had lost to the Philistines, they had taken the ark of God into that battle. But because of the sin in Israel... The presence of God was not there. They could not be victorious. And, and so the ark of God was taken as, as a trophy by the Philistines. Um, and this is where we hear of how they placed the, their god Dagon in front of the, the ark of God. And how Dagon, their, 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 their idol, had fallen down and, and broken into pieces before the ark of God. Because the ark of God represented the presence of God. But can I tell you that nothing, nothing pushes the presence of God away faster or more than sin in your life. See, a new king had, re had raised up, and, and, and he was a man who was after God's own heart. And, and it had been 20 years since, or plus 20, 20 plus years since the ark had been taken by their enemy, the Philistines. And he desired to bring this glory back amongst God's people. For, and this was a very admirable and a very commendable thing that he was doing, and, and, and worthy of great importance. For what is the people of God without the presence of God amongst his people. This is why I don't understand churches who settle for programs that are void of God's presence and how we can just go to church and have a time of, of singing and, and, and hear a message saying amen and go home as if we had church even though God's presence was not there. Especially when Jesus says that greater things shall you do and, and signs and miracles will follow them that believe. Where is the presence of God? Or rather to humble ourselves down and to seek the face of God. You know, we, we, we become like, like, like David's predecessor, Saul. Who thought that just the sacrifice and going through the motions of sacrifice was enough to, to, to get God's blessing. And so rather than to wait for the priest or rather, rather than to wait for the prophet Samuel to come and offer up the offering before God. He thought that he could just do it himself rather than to do it God's way. And because of that, he lost his kingdom. What you must understand is that it is not just a matter of going through the motions. It's about doing what God has said. And so many times we, we have gotten into this mode of just thinking that if we can just go through the motions of church, that we're actually doing something that will please God. And, 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 and really we have become accustomed to doing, just doing church as usual. But, or, or is it rather deeper than that? Is it that we really are just convinced that the way that we have always done it is the only way to do it, as if tradition trumps God. Sometimes we place tradition above what God is speaking into our hearts. David wasn't satisfied with just doing church as usual. I believe that God is raising up a people that are not satisfied with just doing church as usual. I believe that God is raising up a people that really want the presence and are hungry for the presence of God and are willing to do what you need to do to have His presence. Not just in this house, but in your life. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? I believe I am in the presence of the people. Yes. Amen. Yes. See, David wasn't you. Well, well, he wasn't satisfied with just doing church as usual. He desired to bring the glory of God back amongst his people. See, the reason the ark was so significant is because it was a representation of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some history here. If you can flip to the next slide over. It contained within the ark of the covenant or the Ark of God, it contained within it the two tablets of stone which carried the law. And, and, and the reason why this is a representation of Jesus Christ is because the, the law was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. But then we also have the manna, which was the bread that they ate in the wilderness, which represents that Jesus is the true bread. For your fathers ate bread in the wilderness and perished, but I am the true bread, Jesus said. 
And then there was the, 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 the rod of Aaron which budded, representing that life can come from that which is already dead. And so what we see here is how, how the ark of God represents Jesus, but it represented the presence of God. As you can see where the glory will sit between the two cherubim. Here are the two cherubim which, 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 which guarded where, where the presence of the Lord would, would literally sit. This was the area in which the glory of God would beam out of the tent and, and shine up like a light that, that, that would be the glory of God. The Shekinah glory would literally sit upon this area where the, where, where, where the seraphim are. And this is called the mercy seat. What's also interesting to me is how when Jesus rose, rose from the dead, if you can flip to the next side over, how that there were two angelic beings on, the, on, on, on each side of the place where Jesus was laid. And, and, and they said, why are you, when, when the women came to this tomb, they said, why are you seeking the living amongst the dead? For he is no longer here. He is no longer here. For when the veil tore and the presence moved, now the presence of God was no longer bound to a box. It was no longer bound to the ark. It was no longer bound to, it, to any, any, any given specific area. But now the presence of God will be upon the redeemed temple of God's design, which is you and me. You are now the ark of God in which it is to carry the presence of God. That's why we can't just come to a place. God never intended us to come to a box. He intended us to be carriers of Him. He intends for us to carry the presence. That's why you can't just go to church. You can't. That's why it should never be that, 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 that you have to come and get a, get a touch from God. He should already be in you. You bring him with you. Yes. Yes. Is anybody with me in here? Yes. So many times we're coming to, to the house of God to get a touch from God. And yes, there are some times where you need that touch from God. But we also have to realize that that was never God's intention for us to just Come to the house of God to get a touch from God. He wants to dwell inside of you. Can you say amen? amen? This is what David was trying to accomplish. He was trying to bring the presence of God back amongst his people. So he devised a plan. And it was a good plan. It was a good plan. He said everyone in their place. I mean, he had his organizational chart. Let me tell you, he was organized. He had all the people who were supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Everybody had their position, had their responsibilities. You're going to play this instrument, you're going to play that. You, all you soldiers, you're going to protect us. We, and we're going to walk in here. You, all you, you, you're going to sing. You're, you're going to be in charge of this. Um, Ahi and Uzzah, you guys got the cart. Bring the presence of God in. I'm going to worship the Lord, and we're going to bring him into the house of God. So they constructed a good plan and they placed it on a new cart. They didn't just bring any shabby cart. It was a brand new cart. They weren't just going to do it the way that everybody else had done it. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it in style. I can just see bling bling all over the ring, the hubcaps of, of this cart. I mean, it was, it was shiny. It was new. And it was driven by oxen, this strong oxen. And this would usher the presence of God amongst his people. Everything was going great. Everything was going according to plan. You know, if there's one thing that really gets me, is when we really got something planned. And it used to, well, can I just say this? It used to really get on me, but the Lord has really been teaching me. Because now I've come to realize that sometimes things happen. And you know, it, it, it's one of those things that, that, that would really, really drive me crazy before what would be when we have a plan and, and just something just happens. Something, something just happens. Everything is going great. You ever been there before where everything is just going great and then all of a sudden they come to Nacon. Nacon means, well, this, is, this is so amazing. I, the, <laughs> Nacon literally means to set up. You ever felt like you were set up? Mm -hmm. It means to fix, to fix, to fix. So, so literally, they were, they were going to a place that was a setup. So in other words, David was being divinely set up just when everything was going according to plan. The oxen hits a pothole. You ever hit a pothole? I'm not talking about hitting on, on, on the freeway. I'm talking about potholes in your life. 
where everything is going well, you, you had it all planned, everything is going great, then all of a sudden, ugh, out of nowhere, just like it just jumps in front of you, you didn't even see it on you, didn't even see it coming, it just jumps out at you. Everything going good, and all of a sudden things go crazy, and they go crazy really fast. All of a sudden, when you thought you had everything under control, you realize you ain't got no control. And now that, that, is, that is the thing that really is driving you crazy is because you don't know how to bring it back under control. See, this is exactly what happened is that the oxen stumbled and the ark moved and also stuck out his hand to, 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 to steady the ark of God and God struck him dead. You know, this always used to bother me because, I mean... Well, what did God expect him to do? Just let it fall? I mean, he was doing something to help. They, they were bringing the present. They were doing something good. But God got angry because you, you're not supposed to touch what is holy. That's why I'm amazing. And, and, and that's one of the things that, 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 that is really interesting is because when you read the Bible and you don't see it happening today, I'm not saying that I want to see people struck dead, but, but what that does speak to me is, is the way that we the way that we touch what is holy, the way that we don't respect what is really holy, and we treat things as though it's nonchalant. And and and, and, and when, when, when when children start disrespecting their parents, and, and, and when you have things that are that, that, that were never supposed to be done, things that happen that, that, that you don't you don't have that, that that respect anymore, and you don't see it in society today, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Bible tells us that in the last days, and this is how you can know that it's in the last days, because it said that they will consider nothing sacred. The house of God becomes like any other house, and, 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 and what, what should be respected, and what, what God had set up is no longer looked at as something that we need to really think of as important. So God strikes us a dead, and everyone looks at his brother a heel. And a heel says, don't look at me. It was the other guy. <laughs> no, I couldn't read this. I had to destroy that. I made that. But what do you do? <laughs> what do you do when you're trying to do something right and everything seems to go wrong? Anybody ever had that before? You're just trying to do what is right. You're trying to do what is right. You're trying to get your life right back with God and then things just don't seem to go right. You know, you're trying to get this back in order and things don't happen right. And somehow, I think we've got it ingrained in our thinking that anything we do for God, whatever it is, should automatically be blessed. That as if, as, it's as if that if, if, if I'm doing something for God, then God will appreciate what you just do for Him because you're doing something. Lord, at least I'm doing this. At least. But here's the thing. If we get to decide what is good, then that means God is subject to our decisions. Um, last I checked, He was God and we serve Him. Can you say amen? That's why I don't understand this thinking that, well, God, at least I'm doing this. I mean, you should appreciate that. Oh, okay. So, and, and, but, but I will also remind you that just because something, something that seems good does it mean that it is good? Does it mean that it is God just because it seems right? The Bible says that, 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 that there is a way that seems right unto man, but its end is in death. Well, let me take this on the flip side as well. Because on the flip side, so it's not just to say that just because something seems good that God should just bless it. Because we're trying to do something good that God should just honor whatever we do for him. He should just appreciate it. As if God is waiting on us to do something. He doesn't need us. We need. Mm. Okay. So just have to get that right there. But on the other side, let me also put this here. Just because something goes wrong doesn't mean that it's not God. Remember, whenever you are advancing the kingdom of God, you are taking away um, from the kingdom of darkness. And so the kingdom of darkness is not going to let that stuff go free. 
So what you have to realize is just because you're meeting with resistance, it doesn't mean that it's not God's will. Sometimes you're going to have to fight. So, Pastor, how do I know if it's God's will? Ask God. Why have we fallen away from getting to know God and to know His way? Why are we trying to do something without consulting the one? How can you obey someone if you don't ask Him? God doesn't want you to just do what you think He would. You know, well, God, you should just appreciate. That's not what I told you. But you should appreciate. At least I did something. That's not obedience. That's doing whatever you think and, and expecting, expecting God to just appreciate it. Um, that is not placing him as God. That's still placing you as God. Um, and, and, and he should just appreciate whatever you do. Is anybody with me in this house? Yes. See, this is why seeking the face of God and knowing his will is all that matters with doing anything for God. Can I say that again? This is why seeking the face of God and knowing his will is all that matters when doing anything for the Lord. Uzzah quickly discovered this as he tried to save the ark. But what's funny about that is that's like trying to save God. How do you save what's trying to save you? You ever think about that? See, this is why man-made carts and man-made programs always mess up. Because serving God isn't about programs or religion. If religion was the answer, then we, we, we wouldn't need God. Hello? So God ordered a Nacon. He ordered a setup for trouble, not to stop David. God isn't trying to stop you. If you face trouble, God's not trying to stop you. What he's trying to do is throw you off your course so that you can get onto his. Hello? Am I speaking to anybody today? See, maybe the trouble you're facing in your life right now is a setup. That God set it up to drive you to your knees so you'd seek his face so you would know his will. Can you say amen? amen? See, Psalms 37, 23 to 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered. So somebody say order. ordered. You know what ordered means? It means it's not suggested. It means that God ordered for the oxen to stumble when others are trying to stop it, you cannot stop what God ordered. That means what's going on in your life, God ordered it. What if God ordered the trouble in your life? See, we don't like to talk about this. This is where everybody goes quiet. Because at least I had some chirping going around some places, some people saying amen. But, but now when you start talking about this, it's like, we don't want to hear that, Pastor. That's not shouting stuff, but it's true. See, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. See, when, when God orders trouble in your life, and you fall, it's not that you fall to the ground because God catches you. Because what you have to realize is what you're walking on, what you're, what you're standing upon. Unless you're standing upon the solid ground, everything else is seeking yes. sand. And unless you have the foundation and the rock to stand upon, when the storms of life come your way, it will cause you to fall. Yes. But if you stand upon the solid rock, yes. on Christ the solid rock yes. upon which I stand, all other ground, is sinking sand. Yes. That the Lord is literally, even when you stumble, God has his hands there to hold you up. He's holding you up. Somebody say, he's holding me up. See, we like to talk about how God orders blessings. That's the one we like to talk about, Pastor. We like to talk about when God orders blessings, but somehow we often forget that sometimes God orders trouble. You see, when Jonah was going the wrong way, it was God who ordered the fish to swallow him because he was headed to Tarshish and was supposed to go to Nineveh. Remember that it was also God who, who ordered storms and he ordered shipwrecks and sometimes he orders crosses because it was on the cross in which Christ hung upon, in which brought our salvation. Yes. Because sometimes God is revealed in the trouble. <laughs> Does not the Bible say that he is an ever-present help in times of trouble? Yes. How would you
you ever know that he's a healer unless you got sick? How will we know that God is still doing miracles unless the doctor tells you that you have cancer? How would you know that he is a provider unless you had a need that you could not fulfill and that only God could do? God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. He is revealed many times in the trouble. Maybe the trouble that you're facing is a setup. Because can I tell you what is the true mark of a man? Of God? It's not a shining, glowing anointing on your life. It's how much time you spend on your knees in that. It's how much time you spend in the presence of God. That's what makes you a man of God. It's when you put your trust in God. See, God sometimes orders the trouble so that you learn to trust Him through it. So that when your brothers betray you and sell you into Egypt, you understand that what was meant for evil, God in, in, intended for good. That's why James was saying that when trouble comes your way, consider it as an opportunity for great joy. I mean, these apostles, they were crazy to me. Who talks about it like that? Who says, yeah, give me more trouble because God be the glory. Most times we pray, God, take away this, this trouble. But God is revealed in the trouble. That's why Peter, in 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, he said, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that you're going through as if something strange were happening. Wait, 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 hold up, Peter. You ran when trouble came, but then now you're telling me that when trouble comes, it's nothing strange? You think Peter had been through enough things to realize that God is revealed in the storm? God is revealed. How else did he know that Jesus could calm the storm unless he was in a storm that he couldn't handle? That Jesus stood up, he got up, and he spoke to it and said, Peace be still. Amen. Why are we looking at it? Amen. Give God some glory for that. Why are we looking at something strange that is happening to you? I am amazed that when people are going through hard times in their life, that they start questioning God. And it's, it's okay to question God because you need to make sure that you're living right before God and it wasn't something on your part. But realize that, that, that when you're a Christian, you're a believer, your faith is not tested when the sun is shining. Your faith is tested when all hell breaks loose against you and against your family and you get down on your knees and you start praying to God because what you got to realize is the devil thought that by driving you to your knees was going to get you to stop. But what you, when you realize that when you go down to your knees, you're moving out of the way for God to just step into your, to your situation. Can you say amen? amen? See, he says, why are you looking as if something strange were happening to you? Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ. Verse 14, so be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian. For then the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. And then I love how he kind of throws this one in there just in case you miss this point. But then he throws this, if you suffer, however. So this doesn't take out your side of it. See, we like the part where it says be happy in trials because we're going to get something through it. But we don't like this part because sometimes it is us. See, everybody goes quiet. Sometimes it is you. Sometimes it is me. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder and stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's... Mm. So if you're going through suffering, that's not called suffering for Christ, that's called consequence. And sometimes asking God to forgive you doesn't alleviate the consequence Consequence is a result of your decision. That's right. Can you say amen? amen? It's funny how the Lord will put that in there. We were just talking about that. But it's no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. So when you're in trouble, when you deal with trouble, many times it's the trouble that God has revealed. And sometimes God will reveal it to other people by the trouble you go through so that you can show him to other people. Right. Amen. Amen. That, 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 was, that was one of those areas where you should shout amen. Just shout amen. 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 Thank you. What is amazing to me is also how the body of Christ has somehow become religious. 
we, 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 it's almost like the church has begun sleeping. That the people of God have, 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 are just satisfied with just going through the motions and, and, and we have become oblivious to whatever else is going on around us. To where we're perfectly fine and having a service without the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we can just do church but forget about the God of the church. You know, I can't help but wonder about a storm called Harvey that hit Texas. And, and I can't help wonder about that, that it coincidentally hit on a Sunday. And I can't help but also wonder how it is that the name Harvey, by definition, means an army for battle. What was also very coincidental to me is how that this army for battle hit the first place that it hits is a place called Corpus Christi. Because Corpus means body, Christi meaning Christ. And so it's just coincidence that an army for battle hit the body of Christ on the very day that we gather. In order for, was this something that God ordered in order to wake up the body of Christ to realize that we can't keep doing things our way. We need to get down on our knees and seek the faith of God. Yes. This is why God orders trouble. Because he knows that it isn't always easy for us to just change the way we think about things. Can I tell you how difficult it is to convince someone who is already convinced of something? <laughs> that if they are truly convinced that what they believe is truth, that it is very difficult to get through. And sometimes God will allow order to come in, uh, trouble to come in, because trouble has a way of getting to our minds and, and we start to rethink what we thought it would be, that maybe God is trying to tell me something. Yes. But can I just put it to you this way? You don't have to wait for the trouble. That's if you right. just get your life right yes. and just get yes. your life in order, yes. you don't have to wait for trouble to get you to fall yes. to your knees. You can already come to God and yes. ask Him to forgive you yes. and get your life right with Him. Yes. Amen. Yes. It's not always easy to change the way I think about things. It's not always easy to wait to, to just change the way, especially when I have invested some time and energy into this thing. It is often difficult to swallow my pride and to actually rethink this thing. In fact, can I tell you that the reason why Cain killed Abel was because it was easier for Cain to kill Abel than it was, than it was for him to admit that he was wrong? And I can't help but wonder how many times we're willing to sacrifice other people because we're, we can't swallow our pride and rethink that maybe we were wrong. Hmm. Makes me wonder if the reason why so many people lack the presence of God in their life is because they're not willing to change the way they think about how they've always done things. But isn't that the definition of lunacy? To keep on doing things the way you've always done it and expect a different result? You're going to keep banging your head against the wall and hugging yourself pretty soon. Why are we seeking the living amongst the dead? He's not there. He's moved on. I see, here's the question. Do you have the spiritual fortitude to admit that you are going the wrong way and to roll the window down and ask for directions. Because you just might be lost and you might have been wrong in taking that turn. So David sends the ark of God to Obed-Edom's house and God blesses Obed-Edom. Three months pass and the word has reached David that Obed-Edom's house is blessed and everything that is in his house and everything that he does is blessed because the ark of God, because the presence of God is there. And so David starts doing something. He starts seeking. David begins seeking that, that, hey, maybe the way that I did it before was wrong. It's just so hard to just admit that we're wrong. Is it so hard to just humble ourselves and say, hey, maybe I was wrong. Can I tell you that most fights happen not because the other person thinks they're wrong, it's because they think they're right. Who fights a fight and, and, and believes that they're wrong? It's, no, somehow I'm going to be right in this thing. 
I don't care if I'm wrong, I'm going to tell you I'll write till the day I die. I'm going to be right no matter what. Ain't nobody know anybody like that. I know, I know, I know. I'm just talking about other people somewhere else. But you know, <laughs> but can I tell you that God has a way of getting your attention? If trouble doesn't get you, if trouble doesn't wake you up, then sometimes God will bless somebody else with the blessing he meant for you to break your pride so that you stop the car and start asking for directions. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God will allow, will, will begin to bless somebody else in front of you so that you can see the blessing he was going to give you so that you realize, not so that God can just say, eh, I told you so, but so that God can tell you that if you do what I tell you to do, yes. then you can have the same thing that I'm blessing him with. Yes. So humble yourself down and stop the car, ask for directions, it's okay to admit that you know what, I might gotta do a U-turn here. God never intended for his presence to be carried on a cart. He always intended for his presence to be carried on the shoulders of those who are set apart. Those who have set themselves apart for God's glory. Yes. See, here's the thing you got to realize. You can't have glory and not carry the weight of it. You can't just take the position and not take the responsibility that comes with it. That's right. You cannot carry the weight of it and not get personally involved with God. Right. But so many people want the position, but they don't want the responsibility of it. In fact, as we are having our leadership meeting, it says if you want to check, if you want to check the, the health of a ministry, if you want to check the health of a business, if you want to check the health of, of an organization, then put the thermometer in the leader's mouth because it all comes and it all starts with leadership. Yes. You can't carry an anointing for something you're not personally invested into. You can't just slap something together and expect God to be impressed with it. Because you, you cannot lead by position. You lead by example. Yes. Right, man. Yes. Yes, my God. Why should God put more on you if you can't handle what he's already? Right. Yes. So the first thing David does is he places the glory on the shoulders of the priest where it was always meant to be. And here's the next thing you got to realize. See, the next thing David did is every time he took six steps, David would offer up worship through sacrifice and dance. And this wasn't no half-hearted dance like, yeah. Like so many people are accustomed to. The Bible says that David danced with all of his might. David danced with all of his might. And you know what's interesting is, as I began to think about that, I just started hearing Fred Hammond sing, you know, when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. And, 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 and I began to think about this and then the Lord asked me a question. He said, why are my people waiting for my spirit to make them worship? That's right. People are literally waiting for the spirit of the Lord to come upon them for them to dance. Why can't they begin to worship me yeah. out of a heart of gratitude yeah. for what I've already done? Yeah. Because true worship is enforced by my spirit. So many people are waiting for the spirit of God to come and make you. That's right. No, out of a heart of, of, of gratitude for what yes. God has already done is where true worship stems from. Yes. This is where true worship comes from. Worship is not something that we have to prod you to or bring you to. It is not something that it comes from what God, when you realize that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here. Now I know you might be taking notes, but can you just take a moment and give God some glory? Somebody give God some praise in the house. Yes! Yes! Hallelujah! We serve a God that heals cancer. We serve a God that turns lives around and heals marriages. Somebody give God some praise in Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God 
I'll bring back the true worshipers. Yes, Lord. Who are going to wait for their song. Well, what? People is like, oh, I ain't going to worship. This ain't my song. You ain't got no song. Yes. It ain't your song anyway. It's his song. All his songs is for him. It ain't about you. That's right. That's right. Amen. Praise Would you start making your way up here and play one of God's songs? Amen. See, well, God, bring back the worshipers. Lord, bring back the glory. Bring back the worshipers. Yes. You know, David danced so much. See, I love how the Bible describes this because it didn't just say, you got to understand, this is the king of Israel. The king of God's people. And David begins dancing and dancing, and he put all of himself in it. He danced so much that he danced right out of his clothes. Yeah. And literally, David started dancing, and things just started coming off, and he started dancing and dancing, and he started dancing naked. It was so much so that his wife, as she looked out of the window, saw her husband, the king of Israel. Looking like a fool, she got embarrassed. You know what's so funny? I think about it. Is when God called me to the ministry, He told me I was supposed to preach that Sunday. When I went and told my wife about it, she told me, No, you're not. <laughs> I said, Yes, I am. God told me, She said, No, you are not going to make me look stupid. Yeah. It wasn't even about me, it was about what I was doing. <laughs> but David danced so much that he came out of his clothes. You know, so, of course, I'm going to ask God. I was like, God. Are you telling me we need to dance up out of our clothes here? God said, it's not a matter of coming out of your clothes. It's a matter that so many people have never thrown their whole self at it. The reason some people are not walking in greater anointing is because they have never given all of themselves to me. They're afraid of what this person thinks or what that person thinks about me. That they're not willing to give their whole self to me. They want to give me part of them, and they want me to give them everything else. They want to give part to me. They want to give me change, but then they want to give their whole self to the world. They want to give me a little, but then they want to give a whole lot to their job. Right. And they want me to bless them. They want to give more to things, other things, than they want to give to me. And they expect me to bless them. Is anybody with me in this house? They want more of me, but are not willing to give me more of them. Can I tell you something? You cannot have more of God and give less of you. That's right. You cannot carry a heavier anointing and not give more of yourself. That's right. You cannot walk in a greater glory and a greater anointing and be more available and more able to, for God to flow through you if you're not willing to give more to God. Yes. Right. Bible says in Jeremiah 29, verse 13, He said, you will seek me and find me. When you seek me, all of your heart. With all of your heart. I don't want just part of your heart. I don't just want some of you. See, so what you got to realize is they have a term in gambling. Can I see you talking about gambling? Yeah, I'm talking about it. Because we'll do more for that than we'll do for God. See, what you got to realize, stepping out in faith is a lot like gambling. Because you're trusting in a God you cannot see. But in order for you to walk in what God has called you to walk in, you got to go all in. So can I tell you that God, if He is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. You cannot just say that Jesus is Lord and not say it with your life. You cannot just give lip service to God and think that you're going to trick Him. Why do we play games with a God who knows everything, even knows you better than you know yourself? How are you 
going to play God. But I believe that there is a people in this house today that are not going to hold back anything from God anymore. To realize that I'm going to go all the way in. I'm going to go all the way in with God. I'm not going to hold nothing back. He deserves all of it. He deserves everything of me. And even if nobody else around me does it, even if my spouse don't do it, I'm going to give God everything. Because your marriage ain't going to work unless God is in the middle of it. Your household. Can't wait for your household to get ready. You got to get it right. You got to be that light in darkness. You got to be that example in darkness. Sometimes God sends you because there ain't nobody else to do it. That's why he orders your steps. That's why you got to go all in. It's all or nothing. All or nothing. All or nothing. It's all or nothing. Give it all to God. Don't hold nothing back. Say, you will seek me and find me. The reason why so many people have not found him is because you've never given your whole self to him. But I believe that there's a people here today that are ready to give their whole self to God. No matter how long you've been serving the Lord, sometimes there are things that come in and try to pull things away from God. And at one point you had given everything to God and, and, and things had come in and started leeching leeching energies and leeching funds and leeching things out of you and pulling part of you away from God but now is the time to, to, to give your whole self to God if you don't understand that we are living in the last days the main man is on fire for in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars fires and earthquakes you didn't realize that we're li literally living in that day that we don't have time to play but this might be your last chance to give all to God and I'm not trying to get this to get, get this feeling out of you to, 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 to try to scare you into the kingdom but I am trying to get you to make a decision that either you're going to give all to God and stop playing the games but you're going to actually make a decision in your life to give it all to God I'm not going to hold nothing back. I'm going all in, God. How many of you will stand with me and say, God, I'm going all in? Would you stand to your feet and say, God, I'm going all in. I'm going all in. I'm going all in. Raise two hands towards heaven. Don't hold nothing back. Say, God, I'm going all in, God. Father, I'm going all in. You have all of me, Father. I want all of you, Father. Give all. Give, I give myself away. I give myself away to you. I give myself away to you. I give you all of me, Father. Take it all, Father. Submit my whole self to you. No longer am I going to try to figure this thing out on my own, Father. I must seek your face. No longer am I going to try to just do something that I think you want, Father. I must seek your face. I'm going to get down on my knees and spend time with you, Father. But give my whole self to you. Holding nothing back. Yes. I belong to you. Would you just say that, Lord, I belong to you? I belong to you. I belong to you. Would you just take a moment and, and just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Some of you already know what he's saying to you. I just want you to seek the heart of God and seek the face of God. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. He is our guide. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me personally? I've heard a message of what you're speaking to Pastor Jim, but Lord, I need to hear from you, Father. Would you speak to my life? I know that's why David literally came to you and said, Lord, search my heart, O oh God. See if there's any wicked way in me, Father. Lord, is there any area in my life, Father, of disobedience to you where I've done it my way? 
Father God, Lord, I submit my life to you this day. For it's only those who make Jesus Christ their Lord that shall be saved. Father, I pray, Lord, that as I give it all to you, meaning that you take full ownership of my life, Father. No longer will I live it for you, but I live, um, no longer will I live it for myself, but I will live for you, Father. Take this life, Father. Take this life. I give my life to you, Father. How many of you, that's your prayer? Lord, I give my life to you. Would you just raise your hands? Lord, I give my life to you. Amen. Amen. God sees those hands. I just want us to take a moment of worshiping the Lord. Let this be your prayer to Him. Saying, I give my whole self to you. Can we see that song? Can we play that? Give myself away. You know what I'm saying?